Let us pray. God, we ask your spirit to be with us, to open up our hearts and minds so we can receive what you have to give to us today. In these scriptures, songs we sing, words that are said, help us to know your need for who we are, your desire for who we can become. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today our gospel lesson is all about the Holy Spirit. So who gives us the Holy Spirit? God does. Does everybody get it? Yep. Maybe it stays dormant in some people doesn't get activated until we begin to do what Jesus says. And do you know what Jesus said to do? What are his commandments? How about this one? Very first one. Follow me. Live like Jesus. Or this one. Love one another. Again, Love like Jesus. So when we do those things that Jesus said to do, that Holy Spirit that God has already planted deep within our souls comes alive. Gives us the power to do what Jesus says. And God is present with us. God's essence is a part of our souls. Or as Jesus says, on that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, as I am in you. So what is it like to have the Holy Spirit within you? I know I've told this story before, but it's too good not to tell again. See, us old people can remember what it was like to get our music from vinyl records. You guys don't even know what a vinyl record is, do you? They're back in style. <laughs> 45s stacked on top of each other. And you'd play them over and over and over again. One pastor talks about placing the phonograph needle once again on the grooves of his favorite guitar player, Jimmy Reed. Jimmy Reed was known as a Bayou guitar player. And he said, after listening to him for so long, if you listen very carefully, you could sometimes hear ever so faintly in the background a soft woman's voice murmuring before the next verse of the next song. And the story grew that maybe Jimmy Reed was so absorbed in the bluesy beat he was throbbing on his guitar, he simply could not remember the words of his own songs and he needed a little help with those lyrics. And the woman's voice deep in the grooves of those records was his wife, coaching her husband through the recording session by whispering the upcoming stanzas into his ear as he sang. Jesus tells his followers that the role of the Holy Spirit is in effect to whisper the lyrics of the gospel song into the ears of the faithful. When Jesus was there, he was the one who gave them the right words, who coached them through the proper verses, who taught them his joyful commandments. But now that Jesus is approaching his death, now that he draws near to his time of departure, now that the disciples will be on their own without him, the task is handed over to the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So this pastor says that the primary task then of the Holy Spirit is to remind the faithful of the truth, to jog the memories of his followers of Jesus and all of his commandments so that they kept them in love. Whispering the lyrics of the never-ending hymn of faithful obedience in their ears. So the primary activity of the Spirit is reminding the children of God about everything Jesus had taught them, had taught us. Whispering the gospel lyrics into our forgetful ears. 
A friend who was a minister talked about an experience he had taking communion to a woman in a nursing home who had Alzheimer's disease. When she got there, the woman's room, she tried to carry on a conversation with her, and even though she had been a member of that minister's church for years and the minister had known her for a very long time, meaningful communication was impossible. The woman was confused, disoriented, simply could not remember anything, including who she was or who the minister was. And the minister set up the communion elements and the woman's confusion increasing the bread and the cup on her hospital table. She furrowed her brow, tried to sweep them off with her hand. What is this? But when the minister started the familiar communion liturgy, she calmed. The Holy Spirit irrigated the furrows of the woman's memory deeper than any disease more profound than any confusion. Those words on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, the minister said. And the woman started to repeat the words silently with her lips. This is my body given for you. She was now quietly speaking the words along with the minister, the spirit, whispering the lyrics in her ear. When the bread and the wine were offered, she eagerly, hungrily took them in their hands. These are the gifts of God. For this daughter of God. Marianne Bird writes a story from her childhood. It's called the Whisper Test. She said, I knew growing up I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft plate. When I started school, my classmates made it clear to my, me that I must look differently than other kids. A girl with a misshapen lip, a crooked nose, lopsided teeth, garbled speech. Schoolmates would ask, what happened to your lip? And I'd tell them I fell on and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow that seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. She said, I was convinced no one outside my family would love them, would love me. She said, there was, however, a teacher in the second grade that we all adored, Mrs. Leonard. She was short, round, happy, a sparkling lady. Annually, she said we would have to take a hearing test. She said I was virtually deaf in one of my ears, and when I'd taken the test before, I discovered if I didn't press my hand so tightly on my ears when I was instructed to, I could pass the test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everybody in the class, and finally it was my turn, and she said I knew from past years that as we stood at the door and covered one ear, the teacher at the desk would whisper something and we would have to repeat it back. She'd say things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? She said, I waited there for those words that God must have put in her mouth. Seven words that changed my life. Because Mrs. Leonard, from her desk, in her whisper, she said, I wish you were my little girl. What is it that you need the Holy Spirit to whisper in your ear today? Do you need God to say, I love you just as you are? Or is God whispering you today, let me have that anger, that guilt, hand it over to me and you'll be free to love in ways you never dreamed of before? What if God, through the Holy Spirit, is whispering into your soul today that you are enough, you are cherished, you are beautiful to me, you're not alone? James Moore, one of my favorite Southern Bible-telling, storytelling preachers from Houston in his book called Standing on the Promises or Sitting on the Premises, talks about an American citizen that many years ago was visiting the city of Damascus. He came into a famous marketplace in the street called Straight. And the market was busy, it was crowded, teeming with merchants and shoppers and tourists. And into that bustling place came a man riding slowly through the crowd on a bicycle, balancing a basket of oranges on the handlebars. And he got bumped accidentally by a porter who was so bent over carrying a heavy burden he didn't see him and the burden was dropped and the oranges scattered 
And a bitter altercation broke out between the cyclist and the porter. Angry words, threats, hostilities were shouted. The crowd gathered to watch what was certain to become a bloody fight. And the enraged cyclist moved toward the porter with a clenched fist. And just then, a tattered little man stepped out of the crowd, got himself between the two adversaries. And that little man did an amazing thing. He reached out. He took the cyclist's clenched fist in his hands. And he kissed it. He kissed the fist. And a murmur of approval swept through the crowd and they laughed and they applauded and the two antagonists relaxed a little bit and they hugged each other and all the people started to pick up the oranges and the things that had been dropped and the little man started to drift away and the American followed him and said that was a brave beautiful thing you just did he said that was wonderful why did you do that why did you risk it and the little man smiled and said because I'm a Christian Spirit of Christ is in me. He gave me the courage to be a peacemaker. He gave me the courage to do the right thing. Courage is a rare commodity in our world. The early followers of Jesus gained their courage from the presence of Christ's spirit within them. Same thing can happen with us. There are times when you and I need to be courageous to stand up for those things that are right and good and lasting and we get courage we receive comfort from the spirit that's in us some of you may remember the comedian Don DeLuise he knows what it is to be depressed he also knows something about dealing with depression in his life he said people who are feeling down they don't take advice the nature of their illness is that they do not take advice. If I were to give advice, though, I would tell them to find somebody else who's in trouble. Go to hospitals, go to a person in need and do something for them. Leave all your troubles and try to get a smile on their faces. Then he indulges in a little bit of theology and he says, what happens is, God says, because you cared for others, I will give you a good feeling. And that good feeling is genuine. It doesn't come from a candy bar. It doesn't come from some kind of drug. It comes from helping other people. I think that's the spirit. Someone has said there are 10 ways to get over the blues. The first way is to help somebody else. Then repeat that nine times. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Jesus was the first advocate for God. The Spirit is the second. And what are Jesus' commandments? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Love is the first key when you're desolate, both giving and receiving love. I am in my Father, Christ says to us, and you are in me as I am in you. Did you hear that? Christ is within us. You don't have to go to a mountaintop to find God. You don't have to peer through the Hubble telescope. All we have to do is listen for that divine whisper within ourselves. The ancient sage Theophan the Recluse used to say, find that place in your heart and speak there with the Lord. Your heart is the Lord's reception room. Some people seem to find this room easily. Others have difficulty. Pastor John Ortberg tells a story about a couple friends of his who have a daughter. She's five years old. And this little girl said to her parents, I know Jesus lives in my heart because when I put my hand on it, I can feel him walking around in there. The story told about a mother, instead of asking her kids the question, how was your day? She did something more helpful. She tucked her kids into bed each night. She asked them, where did you meet God today? In answer to their question, where they met God, they'd say one by one, this teacher helped me. Or there was a homeless person in the park where I saw a tree with lots of flowers in it. 
And after they finished telling her where they had met God that day, she would tell them where she met God too. It's basically the faith five thing that we've talked about with our congregation before. Google that. Five things you do with your family before you go to sleep at night. But one more thing here, Christ says, because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you realize that I am in my Father and you are in me as I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And Jesus commanded us to love one another as he loved. He's replacing our own agenda and priorities and replacing them with his own. The moment we accept Jesus as our Lord, his life purpose becomes loving others. Our life purpose becomes loving others like Jesus did. It's like a man named Roger. When Roger was in junior high, his parents divorced and moved to Ohio with his mother. He moved there and he and his siblings were in a crowded house. He spent most nights sleeping on a cold floor in a tiny closet. He said, it was just the situation we were in. And Roger's childhood struggles taught him to be sensitive to others in need, to build his life around something more than just his own happiness. And one day Roger came across a statistic about how many children do not have beds to sleep on in his home county of Lorain, Ohio. He was stunned by the information and decided he was gonna do something about it. So he founded a nonprofit organization called Sleep in Heavenly Peace that makes beds for children in need. And he flew to Idaho to learn about how to make bunk beds and then flew back to Ohio to start his chapter of his own nonprofit in his hometown. And he recruited a team of volunteers and sponsors and they started making bunk beds for children in need right there in his county in Ohio. He said, it's worth it when you see the smiles on the faces of those kids. Roger says, well, there was one little girl who asked, why are you doing this? He just said, because we love you. He found his life's purpose in making bunk beds for children who didn't have a bed. He found his purpose in loving others. And his commitment to this purpose brings him joy inspires and touches the lives of others. Jesus' mission and message live in him and in his work. So if we listen, God in the Holy Spirit is speaking, whispering. And if we feel our hearts, Jesus is just walking around in there. giving us strength. That's all we need to know about the Holy Spirit. Amen.